Come it's on, a photo. Come on. Ah, oh, come on. If you do the right thing, we don't have to tell you off, so please don't. <laughs> There is no don't legislation or act set in law that allows you to be standing here harassing me right now. I'm not harassing. I'm you are harassing and you are intimidating. You are armed, sir, and you are here harassing and intimidating. I'm armed for my you job. I'm not harassing. Move. You're not doing your job. You're extending the limitations of your authority by asking me to remove these signs when there is no clear I didn't ask you to remove them. Or statutory regulation that does not allow me to put my signs in. Now, sir, I ask you to move away from me so you don't further harass and intimidate Are you ready right to now harassing me. Are you ready for this? Okay, you've had your say. Are you ready to listen to okay, mine? Okay, you have your say. Okay. The council doesn't like anybody putting anything up. Now you come outside in front of a court and you put things up where they're not supposed to be. Officer, no, but you know they're going to come. So this is outside your jurisdiction? <laughs> no, it's not because the courts are our jurisdiction. This is not a court, this is a public footpath. Are you aware of that, sir? In front of the court. The environs of the court end at the bottom of the step. It doesn't continue on to public property. Where can you prove that in legislation that the environment stop at the bottom of the step? Check the legislation for yourself. The legislation from the court environments can cover all the courts. So it, it does not cover right public there. property. I must ask you to please leave me alone now because this is harassment, intimidation and bordering on fraud because you're trying to extend the limitations of your authority by saying one law is extended beyond its limitations to apply to my activities here. Today. Asking you a not. question is not harassment. Well, I've asked you to leave me alone and you haven't left me alone. Therefore, you Anna, are, Anna, you are the same as you. Anna, extending my right to be allowed to do something for public? Because you have left the court premises, you are employed by the taxpayer to be monitoring the court, not outside of the court, when nothing is being done that is against the court. So you're not breaking any legislation? I'm not breaking the law here. Now I must ask you one more time, sir, to stop harassing me and stop intimidating me and leave me alone. I don't think this guy's causing any trouble. Okay, you have 15 seconds, sir, to leave me alone while I exercise my powers under Section 458 of the Crimes Act, place you under arrest and charge you for harassment. Now leave me alone. Leave me alone. Very interesting. Get away from me. You are intimidating me here right now and you, have, you are armed. I may exercise my powers under Section 458 of the Crimes Act, 1958, to place you under arrest, take you into court and charge you, sir. It would not be the first time and it would not be the last time I have charged you. Now leave me alone. Would you like to escort me to the court? I asked you many times to leave me alone. Walk away, sir, and hold some honour. Walk away. After all, he's doing no harm. Yeah, this is the sign. It's not. He has every right to be recorded. He has every right to record you. You're a public official and you're paid by the taxpayer. You are in uniform and you are working at the moment. You're on duty. He has every right to record you. You walking up to him earlier on asking him not to record you, you have every right to do that. He has every right to continue recording you as he is doing. So there's some education for you. Now please step away, walk away. Class is dismissed. And now you are feeding your ego by standing here and trying to assert your authority no, over me. I'm waiting for them to give me a response on what I'm to do next. So that's nothing. So you're a that. slave to them, are you? I'm a slave to my job, yes. Just like everybody else that works. And, you have a job to and, do, I have a job to do. What you're saying now is because you've got nothing to do, you're taking on the job of the council no. and enforcing bylaws, are you? No, that's not true. You've got a job to do, but this guy's not causing any harm. He's just standing here and... I understand that. I didn't come to cause any harm either, but he's not allowed to put the signs up there. Yes, that's all I asked was... Be, to I asked you nicely to put the, the signs back where you had them before when we didn't do anything to you, and you wouldn't. So you need to wait now. Yes, you have... I need to wait. Hang on. What are you this? So are you saying I am being detained? Oh, didn't you just say that I had to wait? 
I said you need to wait. Like, I need to wait for the next thing you're going to do there. But what so I what you're you saying is I'm being detained? No, I did not say that. You're then why did you say that I had to wait? Did you have to wait for my response? I don't have to wait for anything. Oh, don't you don't wait. So. You have no authority for it. Your authority is enacted in statutory legislation. Under the Constitution, I have all the power. Under, under the Constitution of Australia, I have the power for it. You have nothing but statutory legislation or policy to enforce. That's all you have. Everything you enforce in there is for policy. I have the Constitution for it. You have no power for it. Hello, it's now been a couple of weeks since I was appointed to the role of Chief Commissioner. For me, I was thrilled. It was a privilege, is a privilege, and I'm so proud to be in that role. But I think given that I've got such a trusted role, it's important I tell you what my vision is, what plans I have for the organisation moving forward over the next five years. For me, it's a simple message. It's back to the basics. When I say back to the basics, it's about driving down crime. It's about community engagement. It's about the community, you, feeling safe and being safe. It's about reducing road trauma. It's about us focusing on everything you would have an expectation we would focus on to do our job. We can only do that when we're working with you. So all of my officers will be out there engaging. I have an expectation of a high visible police presence. And by that I mean on the roads, you'll be seeing many police cars, at shopping centres, at transport hubs. It's about that visible presence by us to prevent and deter crime. It's a fairly basic message but it's a very important message and it's one that I promise you we will be delivering over that five years. Thank you for your time. Stay safe. Victoria Police Protective Services officers are now on the move. We are now patrolling the platforms, trains and surrounding areas across the Metro Railway network. Our role is to keep the public safe and respond to antisocial behaviours and offences. We have a number of powers including the ability to arrest and detain, search people and property and seize items such as weapons, graffiti implements and alcohol as well as issue infringement notices. We're with you throughout your journey, working together to keep you safe. This house, or what's left of the house, my grandparents built that in 1938. We can't replace it. I've been a volunteer with the CFA for 30 years, so I got a call late on, on the first day and they were looking for strike teams to go down to the fires that were heading towards Township of Walwa and then eventually as the fire just kept growing in size and, and running we then followed it from Walwa back to Kudjuor. The fire had, had roared across the flats much faster than expected. It wasn't burning traditionally, uh, it's gone into, a lot of times it's gone to fingers with no rhyme or reason and it's actually burned as though we haven't had rain in, in years. About 4.30 in the morning, I actually got back here. We didn't actually know what was burnt or where the rest of the crew had houses to go back to. So I found all this. Uh, my house burnt to the ground, mum and dad's burnt to the ground, and all the sheds burnt to the ground. Mum and dad's cars were gone. I hoped that they were alive because there was no cars. I still didn't actually know where they were at that stage. So I was on duty on the night that the fires crossed the river from New South Wales into Victoria. The townships of uh, Clacklack, Kajiwara and Coryong were impacted on Wednesday morning, I believe. 
Uh, on the Friday, I went to Coryong. We'd been on since 6 a.m. This was after dark by the time we got up to the uh, relief centre to just help out. I just wanted to touch base with some of the locals that I've known for a long time. And that's when I ran into Grant. And he was about to walk out. And I, I actually said to him, I said, well, have you eaten? And he said, no, I hadn't. I said, well, what have you been eating? And, and he hadn't, um, basically hadn't. He'd been fed by CFA, but other than that, he was just sort of scrounging bits and pieces where he could find them. He was in the same clothes he'd been wearing on, on Tuesday night when he'd gone out on a fire truck to go and help others. The only clothes I had were the clothes that I was wearing under my turnout gear for the fire brigade. Um, so I'd been in them for a couple of days by that stage and started to get blisters on my feet. And thought a simple thing would be just go and get some Band-Aids, but Band-Aids that I'd normally have in the first aid kit in my car the car burnt to the ground so I had none of that and it was really strange where we normally be helping everybody else to actually have to go in there and then beg is probably not the right word but, but asking them for food when, when we wouldn't normally ask for anything like that. I ended up having to take him by the arm and, and walk him into the relief centre to actually get him to go in and get help. He just did not want to ask and, and in the end I think it took me basically leading him to, to then go, yes, okay, I'm, I'm going to accept this help. And, and I knew he needed it, he just didn't want to ask. It was only thanks to actually running into one of the local police, to be honest, that I actually got fed and actually got Band-Aids. I wasn't quite sure where else to go, and from someone that doesn't normally ask for help, it was awful hard to go in there in the first place. Um, and then one of the officers was sort of pointed me in the right direction and made sure I was, I was looked after. And it's still been hard to go back and ask for help. So they've been really good looking after us. As a local member, as you know, somebody in an emergency service role who knew the area and knew the people, I really felt like I needed to be a strong point of contact for people to have somebody they could go to that they could trust. Not only try to support them, but you know, you're feeling their emotions. At this stage, we rebuild. Um, I'm fourth generation, so I can't see myself leaving the farm now after all this time. So we'll um, just rebuild, all the community will probably come together and the grass can grow back, the fences and houses we can rebuild, but luckily there was no lives lost, so that's, that's one bonus. I really hope that he and others like him um, know that they can continue to put their hand up for a bit of assistance. We as police and as a community, I think we're going to have to really be mindful of and watch for the signs of people who aren't doing okay. Being a PCO is a fantastic job. My number one role is to make sure that people in custody in Swan Hill are looked after and kept safe. My experience is that the members of the police force here are very appreciative of our role and, and what we do. Well, the PCOs have been the best thing that Victoria Police have implemented. They're able to do the welfare checks, the preparation of meals. I've gained so many different strengths being a PCO. It's gratifying to know that what I'm doing is making life easier for the people that are in custody. My experience working at the station has been one of the most positive things I've ever done. There are so many good things about Swan Hill. It's a great community to be a part of. There are so many different sporting opportunities. Basketball, netball, football. We have the river, we have the lakes. It's an integral part of, of living in Swan Hill. The people here are so accepting of anyone new. It's friendly, people take care of each other. I definitely feel like I'm an appreciated member of the Swan Hill Police Team. Authorised by the Victorian Government, One Treasury Place, Melbourne. Victoria Police will be given shoot-to-kill powers during vehicle attacks in a first for Australian police. Let's go live now to Melbourne reporter Patrick Murrell. Pat, this comes nearly three years after that deadly Burke Street rampage. 
Victoria Police was strongly criticised for not doing enough to stop killer driver James Gargasoulis in the events leading up to the deadly Burke Street rampage which saw six people killed and 27 more injured. This policy is an attempt to stop vehicle uh, threats from becoming uh, vehicle, uh, events that uh, kill uh, people and it's uh, aimed at stopping people from using their vehicles as weapons. It is an Australian first and under it officers would have all sorts of options to stop threats from becoming attacks. That's everything from ramming to boxing in vehicles and if worse comes to worst, uh, being able to shoot and kill the driver. This is an Australian first policy. Officers here in Victoria will begin their training in December and it's part of a suite of tactical options to stop these sorts of attacks. Of course, after Burke Street, we saw the landscape of Melbourne change. Everything from security bollards to police tactics have evolved after that deadly attack. Uh, and this uh, policy and Victoria Police's old policy will no doubt be a focus in the upcoming Burke Street inquest beginning here in Melbourne next month. Pat, thank you. This is Eve Black, the latest COVID-idiot to come out of Melbourne, talking her way through a police checkpoint without providing proof of where or why she was travelling. So where have you come from today? I don't need to answer your questions. No. no. Have I committed a crime? Pardon? Have I committed a crime? Have I committed a crime? Thank you. <laughs> yes! Um, this was a selfish and childish act. It was ridiculous and it was unnecessary. Officers had the power to demand her to hand over her licence, but didn't, instead waving her through. They're trying to limit the time that people spend on the checkpoint, so they haven't actually been asking for the licence commonly in the first instance. Unfortunately, if we get this type of behaviour, we'll need to do that on each and every occasion. Ms Black is a conspiracy theorist who believes coronavirus is a hoax and was reading from a widely circulated script from that community. It's not one of your human rights to endanger other people. I'm sure she'll be uh, looking forward to a knock on the door from Victoria Police. Police, they've got a tough job, um, but look, they, they deserve to be supported. And, and some of the idiots we've seen on social media today, frankly, uh, letting themselves down in a very big way. Unfortunately, she's not the only one. Over the past 24 hours, police have conducted 5,300 spot checks and dished out 101 fines as well as 63 warnings, including for those not wearing masks. People who have decided that they want to continue to go to brothels, people who have decided that the gym can continue to operate, and of course people who have decided to go into unrestricted areas. Police efforts are now being assisted by the ADF, numbers now swelling to 1,400. Defence personnel will now be assisting with contact tracing, knocking on people's doors if they don't answer phone calls from the Department of Health within 24 hours of testing positive to coronavirus. If they don't answer in the phone, we'll knock on the door. If they don't come for testing, we'll drive a truck at the end of the street and we'll test them there. They'll continue to keep visiting you, uh, but you'll have some very clear explaining to do as to why you are not at home. So the Victorian police update, lots happening in that state. Let's have a listen. Officer, because of the spread of uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, that there was a need for us to take this action, this drastic action. And as a result, police rapidly deployed. We planned, we spoke with other agencies, and through our State Police Operations Centre and the appointment of a police commander, we managed to deploy on Saturday from 3pm uh, throughout the rest of that day and into the next 500 police per day to actually police and make sure that we were supporting those residents who were in quarantine in those towers and making sure they were getting the services they required. This was unprecedented, if you like, in terms of the, the manner in which we had to respond. But I'm very pleased to say that with the other agencies involved, with the support of Health and Human Services and a range of other supporting agencies, we managed to put in place that quarantine. And now uh, we're working through and planning to make it more smooth flowing as we're going along. There's been some discussions about uh, whether or not police have adequate resources to be able to deal with this. Can I say, we have more than adequate resources to be able to deploy 500 police per day across these nine towers. There are no issues with that whatsoever. And this is a policing role. I want to be perfectly clear about that. There's been speculation about the ADF. This is a policing role. Community engagement, community support, these are all key roles for Victoria Police. 
we have legislative power and legislative authority to be able to conduct certain activities, and that's why we're there. There are a range of issues, obviously, that we may encounter throughout this quarantine period, and this happens in any community. But this community, reflective of other communities as well, but containing some of our more vulnerable people as well, could have issues, mental health issues, family violence issues. There may be a range of emergency management issues that we need to deal with public order, as well as having the power to deal with these situations as they evolve and to be able to enforce as well to make sure where there are some issues that we can explain to the residents that they can't actually leave those premises. So I just want to be really clear, this is absolutely a Victoria Police role. In regards to the ADF, um, we certainly continue to explore, as we do with anything, what contingency planning means for Victoria Police and whether there are other roles the ADF may or may not be able to be used for in the future. And we'll continue to step through that in this rapid planning environment, this evolving environment, as it has been. We know that the ADF are supportive. They've been working through with us through day one in regards to this matter, where they've been logistical back of house uh, deployed in our state control centre. So we'll continue to explore that. I just want to be really clear. This is about police working with the community. You are the community we serve. You are the reason we're there. This is an opportunity for us to show, working together, what we can achieve and how we can get through what is obviously a very significant and stressful period for the residents. We absolutely get that. But for us, it's what can we do to work as your police to help you get through this environment and that's what we'll be doing as we move forward. Community engagement has always been our key role. It is our key role. Sure, we're there to enforce, we're there to make sure people adhere to the rules, but it's about helping the residents of these towers get through this extremely difficult period, and we'll do absolutely everything we can. I would love nothing more than to get through this and for this to be held up as a model where people say, that was absolutely amazing. The police and the communities worked together. They managed to achieve something that was so difficult and they did it in a peaceful, in a combined, in a united manner. And it didn't hurt their relationship. In fact, it enhanced their relationship. That's the approach we want to adopt on the ground. That's what we're doing. We're working with the community. We're your police. We are there to help you and we'll try and work through and do what we can to make sure that things are as peaceful, as calm and as helpful for you as we can. Beck, thanks very much for talking to us. What, okay. what is CERT for people who don't know? So CERT, it stands for the Critical Incident Response Team. Um, we predominantly respond to high-level critical incidents where there's likely to be a violent confrontation. One of our new capabilities is the CST, so that's our CERT security team. Um, we're pre-positioned around the CBD when we get notified and informed of any information that something could be happening, our members want to get there first. The public should be reassured that we dress this way so they can respond as quick as possible to any critical incident that might actually occur in the city or at a major event where there's lots of people. Can you talk us through some of the gear? Yep, so our members are kitted up for a role in CST, so a CERT security team. When they're in this role, they've got their MCX long arm rifle, they've got some left le lethal options in here, taser, some OC spray, they've also got their um, normal firearm and they've also got their ballistic vest and their helmet and some general radio kind of yeah. um, kit. Uh, and some people might look at it and say, look, it's a bit over the top, it's a little bit, you know, heavy handed for a, a state police force. I mean, what's your response to that? It's all about keeping people safe. Our members are highly trained. They know discipline with the firearm. They're not there to try to scare people, if anything. They're there to make sure everyone feels safe and reassured. This is what's required to be proactive, not reactive. So we want to make sure that if anything happens in Victoria, that we can respond. This is clearly the biggest job, uh, the biggest commitment that we have at the moment. It's the most important commitment for Victoria Police, and that is enforcing the Chief Health Officer guidelines. 
I just want to recap really briefly on what we're already doing because we have a significant commitment. We have Operation Sentinel, which is every day 500 police officers out and about uh, tasking, checking populous places, knocking on doors, a whole range of things. We have Operation Sentinel 2, which is the vehicle checkpoints, eight vehicle checkpoints right around the restricted area, those permanent ones where we're checking the access and egress right throughout the state. We have Operation Shielding, 160 transit police officers, uh, transit protective services officers, I should say, and 80 um, police officers from transit who are out there every day and they're making sure that there's public assurance, they're checking um, who should be in proper areas and they're enforcing as you would expect them to be doing so. In addition to that, we have Operation Ribbon as well, which is our family violence operation. So there's a whole range of different areas, including Operation Soteria, where we're helping enforcement at quarantine hotels. All up, we're seeing every day upwards of around 1,500 police and PSOs out there enforcing as they should be. I've committed an extra 250 police and PSOs now to that already significant number. And on a daily basis, they will be enforcing throughout the day, but importantly, of a night time as well. We will have now, because of the curfew, we'll have significant uh, police and PSOs out there, not just in vehicles and doing, um, if you like, static checks, but we'll have vehicle checkpoints where we'll set them up at random places and keep rolling them around Melbourne. So the potential, the opportunity for someone to be detected who isn't supposed to be out and about is significant. Every police officer right throughout our organisation in any patrol car has a responsibility for COVID-19 enforcement and that's what they'll be doing. Every one of them will be making sure that we're enforcing these new guidelines, these restricted guidelines. The curfew is obviously significant because we expect to see much reduced movement right around the state. In terms of discretion, which is a word we've heard a lot, we did give them a period of discretion there when we moved to masks and other restrictions. That period of discretion is, you know, I've said it before, it's virtually closed. Of course, we can't be prescriptive for every circumstance, but it will only be in an exceptional circumstance, in an exceptional circumstance, that Victoria Police will be using discretion because we just have to stop this movement. We have to enforce the CHO guidelines. The vast majority of people are doing the right thing, and for those who are, I thank you, but there is still a, a minority who aren't. We've um, given out a significant range of infringements, as the Minister has outlined, 161 last night. 60 of those were for mask, um, for not wearing masks. And from our perspective, though, the people, the vast majority who are doing the right thing need to understand for those who aren't, there is a consequence. And there are consequences, and I want to be really clear on that. In the last week, we've seen a trend, an emergence, if you like, of groups of people, small groups, but nonetheless concerning groups who classify themselves as so sovereign citizens, whatever that might mean, uh, people who don't think the law applies to them. We've seen them at checkpoints, baiting police, um, not providing their name and address. On at least three or four occasions in the past week, we've had to smash the windows of people in cars and pull them out of there so they could provide their details because they weren't telling us where they were going. They weren't adhering to the Chief Health Officer guidelines. They weren't providing their name and their address. We don't want to be doing that, but people have to absolutely understand there are consequences for your actions, and if you're not doing the right thing, we will not hesitate to issue infringements, to arrest you, to detain you where it's appropriate. As I say, it's not something we want to be doing, but it is what we will do, and it has been occurring in the last week. And particularly one incident, if I like to highlight the type of challenges uh, that, um, that we're experiencing. Last night, a 26-year-old policewoman was on patrol with another partner uh, down in the Frankston area near the Bayside Shopping Centre. During that time, they approached a 38-year-old woman who wasn't wearing a mask. After a confrontation and being assaulted by that woman, those police officers went to ground and there was a scuffle. And during that scuffle, this 38-year-old woman um, hit the head, smashed the head of the policewoman several times into a concrete area on the ground. That behaviour is just totally unacceptable. That's someone who thinks they're above the law, they're not wearing a mask, they're approached and they're asked their reason why not, and then to react like that is just completely over the top. 
It's this type of irresponsible behaviour that we're going to address. That woman was taken back to the police station. She was charged with significant offences and bailed due to no criminal history. But nonetheless, it just goes to show how these things escalate from not adherence to the smallest things. The message is clear from me, and it's simple. We want you to stay at home. That's what the Chief Health Officer wants you to do. We expect you to, adhere, you to adhere to the Chief Health Officer guidelines. If you don't, we will be enforcing those. We will issue infringements. We will arrest you. We will detain you where we have to. We now have significant new, um, if you like, infringement, um, not powers, but in, in penalties in the infringements. And for those who are not at home when they should be, when they should be self-isolating, when they should be quarantining, and we conduct those checks, we'll issue those infringements. And on that second occasion, you may well get a $5,000 infringement. They're significant penalties. And so the expectation is the consequences are there for you and you must adhere. Um, having said that, the minister has outlined briefly a number of uh, if you like, breaches that occurred last night, and they continue to occur. Over the weekend, we saw Airbnb parties. Clearly, that's not acceptable. We saw people last night, someone who was driving to a bottle shop at three in the morning to get alcohol. That's not acceptable. We saw people going to McDonald's, coming back from McDonald's after getting some burgers. That is not acceptable. There are consequences. We will enforce them, and the window of discretion is virtually closed.